Um, yeah, thanks, um, Bill. And uh, so if I would have to describe or introduce myself with two words, it would be space and programming because this has been my passion since my teenage days and uh, it still is. Um, uh, during my academics, I've worked on two CubeSat missions. So actually I've led um, student teams to develop from scratch. So this was really in the early days of CubeSats where there was not much uh, uh, resources available. So we really started from scratch and we built uh, two CubeSats and they were sent into space at various degree of success, I must say. Um, so there are a lot of lessons learned and we were doing it more or less on our own. And it's only very later that I realized that an open source approach would be much better uh, to, work, to develop CubeSats. Um, so for my work, for my day job, I work uh, at a company called Vision Space and I work as a spacecraft operations engineer um, for ESA at the European Space Operations Center. So there we're doing uh, professional spacecraft operations. And yeah, I have the privilege to work in the space domain. Um, and with LibreCube, I really would hope to, uh, you know, to make this not a privilege anymore, in the meaning that it should not be open to a, a few people to do space exploration, but basically should be um, open to everyone who has the interest. And I know that a lot of people have interest in space. Um, I'm going to switch off my camera because otherwise, you know, it's confusing. It looks like I'm talking to the mirror. And also I will uh, give you the chance to focus on my presentation. So I'm going to present the um, open source ecosystem that uh, LibreCube offers for space and earth exploration. First question, what is LibreCube? So LibreCube is a nonprofit initiative to promote open source for um, space and earth exploration. So the open source idea um, adapted for, for space uh, exploration. I also include earth because earth is a planet uh, of our solar system. So uh, let's also include that. And uh, well, what works in space should also work on earth. Uh, but really the focus is on mostly on CubeSats and, and space exploration. So LibreCube is a community that uh, strives to be open, diverse and friendly uh, among the community members. And uh, I put uh, stress here on diverse because in my, uh, in my opinion, um, space exploration should be something that involves all humanity. Yeah? Everyone should be involved in this. So it should not be um, a matter of a few, uh, you know, uh, known figures to decide that the road of space exploration. So everyone should have their say and should be uh, have the chance to involve. And we already are, are quite a vibrant community here. So LibreCube is based on three pillars. That is open source, space standards, and reference architecture. I'm going to explain what this means. Open source, of course, means that everything that we do, everything that we produce, all the projects, they are released under an open source license. I listed some of the licenses that we typically use for different um, products like uh, software libraries or, or hardware, but uh, you're not limited to this. So we, we can use any uh, open source uh, uh, license um, for our projects. And the other point is, and that's really important, is that all the tools that we are using to develop our projects are FOSS as well, so free and open source. Because it wouldn't make much sense to, uh, let's say, open source a, a design that is based on um, or the CATIA, Solid Edge, or Altium, you know, this expensive proprietary software that nobody can afford. And um, so, yeah, what we want is that people have the lowest entry barrier uh, to, 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 to uh, contribute to LibreCube. Um, they only need a computer and the internet connection and that will work. The next uh, pillar is space standards. So um, I told you that during my studies, we have developed CubeSats, but that was, you know, according to best practice or ideas that we had, how we could do, design this and that. Um, 
but space standards, they offer a lot of a wealth of knowledge that many people have uh, worked on and have thought about uh, to make things, um, space systems, uh, robust and reliable. And it really doesn't harm to adopt these ideas and concepts to designing even a small CubeSat. You know, to have redundancy there and really to make things uh, fail safe. And I have um, summarized because, you know, this mostly we use ECSS and CCSDS standards, which are freely available and open. You don't need to pay for them. You can go to the website for ECSS. You have to register though, but you can download all the uh, standards there and they have a lot. So it's really not easy uh, to reach them. Um, it's, yeah, it's standard. So what I've done, I have written a um, small handbook which summarizes most of those standards and it uh, could be a starting point for you to get into the world of space standards. Um, and then the third pillar is really the, the reference architecture. Um, open source is great. Yeah, If you share your design, open source, then others can take it, modify it, adapt it to their needs. That's all fine. But if you want to work together, if you want to build a system of sy systems, yeah, then you need to uh, make sure that the systems can work together. Um, and therefore, you need to define the, the interfaces such that imagine you have a university uh, developing a power system and then another group like a hacker space. So they develop a communication system. And in the end, they want to plug this together and it should work. So therefore, you have to standardize the interfaces um, to enable this true collaboration. And these reference architecture, so does it's a kind of um, decomposition of a whole system um, uh, into subsystems and modules. Um, you can think of uh, a subsystem could be uh, the power system, and then you would describe what the power system, uh, where, where the, the pins to the power, where the power comes out, and what is the, the format of that system. And then imagine that uh, you have this all the specification, and uh, then people can go and uh, take the specification and develop projects or systems that fulfill the uh, these requirements. And they can even create more than one system because they could have different features like more capacity or it could produce, uh, uh, it has more processing power, but still adhering to the interface requirements. And if you have this, then you have a kind of catalog of, of products and, and modules that you can put together to build your system. And then you can build your CubeSat system uh, de depending on the type of mission that you want to do, remote sensing or in-orbit communication. And you can also build other systems like drones and rovers because they all share similarities. They have a, a power system, they have a structure, they have an onboard computer. Um, so a lot of reusability. So this is basically the concept of this reference architecture. Good. Um, and yeah, just one important aspect is actually the um, uh, the specification of this board, which is very uh, heavily used in the CubeSat domain. They all use this kind of PC104 kind of uh, CubeSat uh, board stack. Um, and it has, however, never formally be uh, um, uh, standardized, these interfaces. So um, there's only de facto standardization, but what we want to do now at LibreCube is to, uh, and also together with Libre Space Foundation, is to define a, a minimum set of pins that we define or say they have to carry the power and they have to carry the bus. Um, and we um, also take into account the heritage of, of other CubeSat or uh, suppliers and so on. And, um, yeah, to describe, make this a, um, a standard that at least should be binding for all LibreCube projects. This was the intro to about LibreCube, and now I'm going to introduce you to some of the projects that we have worked on through the last years. In particular, uh, the last two years, we have done a lot of projects uh, related to software because we were all at home and had a lot of time, right? And so the intention here is twofold. First, I want to give you a taste of what we're doing, uh, and I hope also that you get that you find something interesting for you and uh, that triggers your interest to to contribute because we have a lot of more 
projects uh, that are similar like this and that we have ahead of us. So we're starting with pure software uh, projects. Uh, we have developed the SLE uh, uh, user application, which is the Spacelink extension. What is that? OK, let me explain. You have a spacecraft. And let's just look at the return link. So the data coming from the spacecraft uh, over the radio link, yeah, it sends its uh, telemetry on science data over the space link, so radio frequency. It arrives at the ground station. And from there, it's, uh, it's trans it, it outputs a bit streamer. Right? And uh, this is, contains your frames um, that you have received, that, that contains the data. And then the SLE provider um, basically, well, here comes the frames. And the SLE provider distributes the frames to the users. Um, so the, the whole thing here, the whole idea, concept, is that you have your mission control system. And it might not, the mission control system might not sit next to your ground station. Maybe this was the case in the early days of space exploration. And it's surely the case for many university satellites. They have the laboratory, and then they have the antenna on the rooftop. But uh, for larger organizations, companies, and in particular space agencies, typically you have a mission control system uh, at a location, and then you have your ground stations spread all over the world. And of course, you can uh, create your own protocol to communicate with the ground stations. But luckily, CCSDS has provided a standard called SLE, which makes it possible that uh, ground stations uh, talk SLE, then you can connect to them. And only by doing this, uh, it's possible that, uh, for example, at ESA, we can uh, uh, connect to a NASA station uh, and to talk to our satellite. Uh, and also, Jap uh, Japanese space agency can uh, can work through using uh, ESA ground stations. So it's all about cross collaboration, uh, cross uh, support. And so in order to connect, normally the, the picture for you would be different. You would have your SLE user, which is connected to your mission control system. And then you use this to connect to several ground stations where you need it. Yeah. Um, so what you need is a SLE user that outputs then the received data that and it connects to the SLE provider. And that's exactly what we did, right? We have written this here um, protocol stack, the SLE user that can connect over actually terrestrial internet uh, to a ground station. And this is really the few lines of code that you would need to connect, for example, to another station that uh, talks SLE. Of course. Uh, you need a bit more, yeah. You need to have be in the network of another, and uh, you need to have the credentials here. But but uh, this is another aspect. But the use of the Python library is really that simple. You bind to the uh, ground station, you start and stop the delivery of uh, frames, and and at the end of the pass, you do unbind. Okay. So you see, uh, the, the goal here is also to have really simple interfaces. We talk about contacts to um, satellites from ground stations. So uh, you need to have a good link budget. You need to have uh, enough power um, received in order to yeah, get the data. Um, so a link budget, uh, maybe there's some radio amateurs uh, among you. Uh, you know this very well. You have a transmitter. In this case, for the downlink, you have the satellite transmitting data and uh, received uh, by a ground station. And then you have a pass here with gains and losses. And if you do this in DB, then you can uh, even do this by hand. It's just plus and minus. Looks a bit like this. You do this on a spreadsheet. And we have written a, a, a Python library for this. Um, and here's an example. If you fill this with some values, like uh, the TLE of your CubeSat and uh, um, the antenna uh, properties, uh, and then you ca can generate your link budget. And the nice feature about this one is that it's time dependent. You can make everything time dependent. For example, the distance between your ground station and spacecraft surely will not be constant. So it's a function of time. And then you can plot this also. And you see your link budget on uh, and the other parameters. OK, another software project, Pluto to Python. What is that? Well, Pluto is, um, is an ECSS standard. Um, for procedures, yeah. If you operate a spacecraft, 
you do this by procedure. You don't just send commands uh, by uh, as you see fit. Uh, you, for everything you do, uh, for 99% of the cases, you have a procedure in place that is first tested on simulator and then later you use this in flight. And uh, ECSS has defined all the elements that, that a procedure should have, shown here. And they have also informally um, defined a language to fulfill this, um, and that's called Pluto. So the nice feature about this is that it's human readable. It's uh, English, and you can, you can more or less by reading it understand what it's, uh, what it's doing. But it's also passable uh, because it has a certain, it's a domain-specific language, uh, so it can be passed by computer. And this is uh, what we've done. We have written a parser. Uh, that uh, we have written it in Python, and it also outputs Python code. Yeah, we are a bit uh, Python-centric, right? Um, so it outputs this code, which is still readable, but it's not a purpose. You're, you're not supposed to read this one. You're supposed to write your procedure here. And then you, uh, the output will be used by an executor with a model behind to control your system. And it does not need to be a space system or like a satellite. It can be any kind of system that where you can use monitoring and control, for example, your oven uh, or whatever system comes to mind. Okay. Um, so let's go now a bit of a mix between a software and hardware project. Space can is, um, the can means can bus. So if you not don't know what is can bus, it's the thing that runs in your car to gather uh, sensor data and control the motor and so on. So it's a reliable bus system. And uh, I w yeah, at LibreCube, we like to promote the use of CAN bus for CubeSats because onboard communication is very important and must be reliable, of course. Uh, and typically what they use on CubeSats is I2C, which is a protocol that's used for CD player, and video recorder, and this kind of things. Uh, so it was never designed for space. Whereas CAN is some, it's also not, not designed for space, but it's uh, very reliable and exactly defined for that. And yeah, so the, 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 the onset would be that you have an onboard computer, which is your main, um, well, the, the controller of your spacecraft, uh, and it uh, communicates with the other systems, power system, attitude system, by sending telecommands to it and receiving telemetry and to, to check, to control basically your satellite. Um, and this has been standardized by ECSS. So we took this standard as a, um, as a starting point um, and did not take everything out of it because some parts is a bit of a overkill. Uh, but we took these services here and implemented them uh, in, in Python as a first step. But then in order to test it really, uh, we, um, we have ported it to MicroPython, which is a subset of Python. So it's almost a one-to-one -one, uh, copying from Python. Uh, of course, there comes then interrupts and other microcontroller-specific aspects. Um, and uh, we have also, uh, so this is a bit of the difference. Uh, but then we have built up, with this Pi boards here, uh, we have built up the setup. Um, so here's, a, let's say, the onboard computer, and this would be an attitude control system. And they communicate over a redundant CAN bus. So there's bus A and bus 2. If this one fails, then they communicate over the other one. OK. Um, OK, uh, so I'm, I just try to keep this a bit short because uh, uh, for the time. CFTP in Python, I'm just to tell you that this is um, it's the CCSDS file delivery protocol. So it's from CCSDS. And it sounds a bit like FTP, right? File sharing. and I, it's exactly that. It was uh, phew, designed actually in the 90s, I think. But it's only now that this is becoming a really hot topic because all, at least for ESA, all the future spacecrafts and all the, the spacecrafts being launched now, and they are using uh, this uh, file, um, file transfer. Originally, they were focused on, uh, on packets, and they also do this. But file transfer is becoming the big thing. and. Um, so this is what the CFTP protocol does. It's similar like FTP a bit, but it's made for um, for space use where you have where you have um, yeah long delays, yeah, you know, up to more than half an hour uh, sending sending data to your spacecraft. 
uh, depending on where it is in the solar system. Um, so this is taken into account, and you have two base classes of this protocol. You have the unreliable one, where it sends the a file uh, in smaller segments, and it doesn't check if this actually has ever arrived. So, um, but there's also the re reliable transfer, which then in the end checks and requests the receiver requests uh, any missing data. And then here, if everything arrived, it closes the connection. And this is all automata automatic. So there's no user intervention. So this can run really in the background. And you would see your science data files coming in. And again, we have implemented this uh, on a computer first, so on a PC. Here we have the local entity, remote entity. So this would be basically your rover running around driving around and here you have your local entity in order to establish a communication with your rover and, and in this case it's just sending a single file. So it's really not a lot of code to use the library and um, so this was on uh, PC to PC uh, and then we also just recently we're porting this to MicroPython um, so from the PC we send files to this to a small board here ESP32 that runs MicroPython and uh, yeah, this is just recently we we have managed to complete this, and it, it, it's it's really great. Okay, um, I, I skipped this one here. This is purely uh, hardware, so you're welcome to join us there as well. The uh, developing a modular structure, and then shortly I go over the uh, this PCDU as the um, as a power control and distribution unit. The task of a PCDU is it takes input from solar panels and uh, stores energy in the in batteries and then provides energy so constant energy to the system so this basically forms your power system of, of every satellite if you look into a pcdu this is the um, diagram of a reliable and uh, pcu with redundant processors and redundant switches um, and then we translate this diagram into keycard and it looks like this, so schematics of the various um, ICs and, and other components here. Um, you see there's a lot of duplication because this is the redundancy. If one part fails, the system shall still continue to run. Um, and this is how it looks then in hardware. Uh, there's still some stuff to do here, so you're welcome to join us on this project as well. Um, and yeah, talking about joining, would be glad to have you uh, involved here. Uh, check out the website. Of course, you find some information there to get started, link to the repositories. You find an overview of our activities and how to get in contact with the community. And talking about the repository, we have um, structured like this. We have elements. So these are the ready to use elements that you basically take and build and use. There are not so many right now. Um, uh, we have a library which is which you can use for your own applications uh, to integrate in your applications. And most of this stuff uh, you can find in prototypes. So this is uh, a lot of development is going ongoing here. So have a look here if you find something interesting for you. Um, and with that, yeah, um, I close my presentation and uh, I would be happy to uh, to answer your questions. You can also ask in live. You don't have to write. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Arthur. We do have a couple of questions in the chat window. Um, can you read those yourself? You so, see? Alex is asking is the focus on Python for everything just a function of every, everyone knows it? Uh, so, it turns out that, uh, I mean, I have used uh, C and C a, a lot in, in the past, and uh, since a couple of years I, I swapped to Python and I found that Python has a really huge, rich ecosystem. So it goes from web design, web applications, down to microcontrollers now. Um, so uh, language processing, everything yeah, you have there. So I really help. I find it helps to not always switch, have to switch between languages. Um, so I stick to Python uh, as much as I can. We also use, however, for example, Embed framework, which is based on C++ for, um, for SpaceCan, to have another SpaceCan port because uh, for the constrained environment of a microcontroller, sometimes better to use C, C++. And there's, 
Elkos also mentions about comparison. Of course, th then this always comes up, comparison of speed between Python and C++. Of course, in a lot of libraries in Python, they are they're using C and the, they are based on C and C++. Uh, so you already have that a performance. But personally, so far, I've never uh, met something that uh, is so time critical that I was not, uh, that I couldn't do it with Python. But if I would run into this into this uh, problem, then uh, yeah, of course we can we can switch. And if or and, and even then, for time critical system, I would really recommend to start with MicroPython or Python uh, to see how these things work, and and then later on you can still port it to C plus plus. This we have done with the SpaceCan library, for example. Okay. okay, any more questions? No? I've got a quick question. These CubeSats, who regulates the communications? Is it ITU, ESA? Who, who regulates it? Um, yeah, it's ITU. So. It? Okay. okay. Um, uh, question, are you doing anything with Lacuna Laura Comps project? That's an interesting question. Uh, so far, not. Uh, and I heard some strong opinions on LoRa regarding open source. I'm not familiar with LoRa myself. Uh, so far, we just use uh, Wi-Fi and uh, UDP, TCP over Wi-Fi. But um, yeah, we're not there yet. Uh. OK, thanks for that, Arthur. That was a really interesting presentation. And I'd like now to introduce our next speaker um, from, uh, let me see my notes again. Next speaker is going to be uh, Alex Sparks from the Open Space Project. And uh, he's going to introduce um, some really an interesting piece of visualization software. So you might have thought you need billions of dollars to explore space. But you can, in fact, explore space in the comfort of your own armchair, as we are about to see. Take it away, Alex. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not be sharing any presentation directly in this. So if you just make my uh, my uh, webcam video a bit bigger, I will, uh, I'll do everything over this. And I hope that the resolution will be holding up here. So if we switch over to, to the presentation. So uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be here to talk about something almost completely different. So we're not talking about any hardware basically whatsoever and focus entirely on, uh, on the software side of it. Um, and particularly, I'm here uh, both as an assistant professor at Linköping University, but mo more, more focused as the lead developer for the Open Space Project, which is an open source astrovisualization framework that can basically, or the goal is to visualize everything that is available in the universe, piece by piece, of course. Um, OK, so if we get started. Um, First, like a big mission statement for the for the whole software. And our goal is to create an open source browser that can visualize essentially everything. And this is uh, characterized as having a large scale contextualized multi-model astrovisualization engine. That's a bit of a mouthful. So I usually uh, refer to it as a game engine without any gameplay elements, because there's a lot of overlap between those two technologies. And yeah, given that I'm presenting here, everything is open source. So everything's available on GitHub, so you can download it and use it and whatever. So if I, uh, one second, you don't really need to see me anymore. Uh, I'll be back in the, in the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so uh, the idea is to be able to contextualize any kind of scientific data, that is space missions, different observations, simulations, satellite uh, places, and so forth, uh, but then also being able to be flexible enough that you can basically plug in any kind of data that you want. And this should all be running on laptops, on PCs, planetariums, eventually virtual reality headsets and so forth. But then also uh, do like push forward the envelope of um, research in interaction techniques. So here we're looking at different tablets, gesture commands, voice commands, any kind of interactive uh, uh, technique, how to work with, uh, with, 3D, with a 3D environment. And here, the idea is that it's essentially about science communication, uh, outreach, and research. And the research is both in the domain science, so astronomy, astrophysics, but also scientific visualization, where I have half of my hat. Um, 
OpenSpace is a software that is co-developed by mainly five different institutions. So it was started here at Linköping University in Sweden together with the American Museum of Natural History um, about six years ago, seven years ago now. And uh, five years ago, we got uh, some generous funding from NASA to be able to continue the development as open source, which brought on uh, New York University and the University of Utah on board together with the uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, who has been a very long, long running partner for us. So this is basically all of the, the partners that are currently involved. And I'm not going to leave this up for very long because the details don't really matter, but the, the original idea behind the software was to be an academic piece of software. And following this, there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of academic output from this based on the software. And um, here's a selection of the different papers that we have published over the years. But then also, and maybe even more importantly, uh, a lot of master thesis that have been coming out uh, out of this project in the last seven years. And uh, here are here's a list of uh, all of them. So you see that most of the thesis works, it's a quirk of the Swedish system. There's a lot of double names because they're doing the thesis works together as a, part, as a pair. So that's also very, very exciting. Uh, down in the bottom right is the URL if you want to check it out later or otherwise uh, later on the YouTube uh, video. So this was the original idea to have like an academic piece of software. But then uh, after we have gotten the, the grant and we started developing it and people started using it more, we started formulating more of an idea of what we want to do from an outreach point of view. And this next slide basically tells that, tells that story quite well. And here the idea is that we can combine techniques that are used for exploring data together with the, using the same techniques to also explain the data. And this has been combined, um, the exploration, the explanation as the concept of exploration, of using the same software to do both things at the same time. So here we have a public exhibition where people could walk up, uh, grab a game controller, fly around Mars, and look at the high resolution uh, image data that we have. But using exactly the same software, open space in this case, we can throw up the software in the Hayden Planetarium in New York and have domain scientists look at exactly the same rendering methods, exactly the same data sets and everything, and come to very different conclusions. So here, um, uh, the, the kid on the, on the left is exploring Mars and discovering the beauty of the, of the universe. And here on the right, we have uh, Jack Moster from Brown University, who is part of the science definition team for the Perseverance rover. So here, they're looking at the different uh, potential landing sites for the Perseverance rover. So this picture was taken before it was actually land, landing in uh, Jezero Crater. And this kind of, these two images side by side very well describe what our, our goal behind the software is to enable both at the same time and those things cross feed into each other. So for this usage, we distribute our users into three different categories. On the, one height, on the one side, we have users. So those are people that are standing in front of an audience using the software to explain something astrophysical, astronomical to an audience. Um, this can be in a planetarium. This can be uh, via live streams and so forth. Then in the middle, we have our builders who are using the already existing techniques that we have built into open space to create new content. So here we see um, the, the picture is of a, uh, of a hackathon that was held at the AMNH um, where this group was building the messenger spacecraft. Or I mean, they're not building the spacecraft. They were building the visualization around the spacecraft and then showing it in the planetarium afterwards. And then on the far right side, we have our developers who are actually going into the C++ code and developing completely new rendering techniques. And those are most of the, the thesis workers and so forth that I was uh, talking about before. This, of course, cannot be done alone. And I'm just standing here on the shoulders of a lot of different giants. Um, so here we have, in the top row, our administrative team. Uh, and then the next two rows are our current and our previous developers. And then at the bottom, we have all of the different students that have uh, contributed to the software. And here it's really a lot of the features that, uh, that people can see when they download the software and use it. Those are all built on top of these master thesis works that have been extremely successful in my case, or in my view. So, but now if you take a step back and actually look at the software, so, as I said, it was started um, yeah, beginning of 2014, so yeah, what is that, seven years ago now, seven and a half. 
Uh, it's a cross-platform uh, application, so we're running on Windows, Linux, and macOS, though with a strong support for Windows, particularly for planetariums, as most of them are running Windows. Uh, it's written in uh, C++, and we're rendering everything using OpenGL 4.1. Um, the, the majority of the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, customization. And here, we're using Lua as a scripting interface and as a configuration interface for everything as well. And I'm going to be demonstrating that in a second. Um, everything is modularized, so we can build new, new functionality without really um, endangering the stability of the whole architecture. Uh, everything's freely available, as I said before, on GitHub under the MIT license, and we're exclusively building on top of open source de other open source dependencies. So here we have a couple of the, the bigger ones that we're uh, that we're depending on. So using all of this, um, we're we're driving a, a, a large variety of different display environments. So here is just four of the different examples that we can use. So in the top left, we have a regular flat screen rendering of the Earth. And we can see here the, the smog in India at the top. Uh, and it's all like real data, on this, which, which is uh, important to highlight. Uh, in the top right, we have uh, power walls, which are basically compute, multiple computers that are sharing a display environment, uh, fisheye renderings in the lower left, and then uh, planetariums in the lower right. This is all built also on top of more open source software that we're developing, uh, which with a library that is called the Simple Graphics Cluster Toolkit, or SGCT for short. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail here, but uh, this is also available on GitHub. And it essentially allows any kind of application, any kind of graphics application, to run on a large myriad of different systems. So by plugging in some XML configuration, you can make your software render in FishEye, in stereo, in VR, in multiple uh, flat screens, and whatever, basically whatever you want to run, uh, run with this. So, and in the way in a planetarium, how this normally works is that we have our master node, which is controlling everything. And then in the dome that we have here uh, in Noshopping is that we have six projectors that are that are tiling up the, the, the hemispheric uh, surface of the planetarium. So every projector is responsible for a small piece of the planetarium and then they need to be matched perfectly to each other so that everything works, works very smoothly. And that's, uh, that's all what SGCT essentially does under the hood. And this same technology we're now using in a, in a number of planetariums. So it's the Atla Planetarium in the top right, the California Academy of Science in the top left, uh, the CCNY Planetarium in the bottom left, um, Vienna in the bottom right, and a number of other places as well. But then on the, on the, on the, at the same side, as I said in the beginning, we want to drive everything in these planetariums, but also in smaller, um, smaller environments. So as I said, on laptops, here we're seeing the digital sky, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, larger touch screens, essentially big iPads, but then, yeah, planetariums as well. <coughs> and then, you, again, using the same technology, we can show everything in real time, but then also render out uh, pre-rendered movies. So in this case, uh, you're seeing uh, Juna Kohlmeier, the director of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and uh, she was using one of our visualizations in her TED Talk, which is the SDSS and the quasars uh, right behind her. So as I said, everything's the same software. It's the underlying mantra. That's the one thing that uh, I want to take, take you away from this, from this talk. This, of course, comes with a bunch of challenges, and 30 minutes are by no means enough to talk through any of them in detail. Um, but for this talk, I want to really focus on this flexibility aspect of the software, um, because we want to be able to give our builders the ability to build all kinds of things that we never really thought about that would be possible. <clears throat> and as I said before, we are using Lua for this. Um, well, for this purpose. So Lua is a scripting language that is very, very easy to integrate, which is why we chose it. It's, it runs very fast, directly integrates with uh, C code, but then well, we marshal that to C++. Uh, and it's also a relatively easy programming language to, to type for non-programmers, which was also very important. Um, so it's very, very light on syntax that you need to, that you need to explain to someone. 
And within OpenSpace, we are using Lua for everything. Um, any kind of interaction that is not done via the mouse or a game controller is somehow going through Lua. So if we're setting the time in the software, if we're setting which things are currently being visible, what color they have, what item do we want to focus the camera on, um, if we want to add new objects into the scene graph and so forth, all of, that's, all of that is done via Lua scripts. And even if we're doing some key bindings to help people do their presentations, that also is going through Lua and uh, that helps that helps us quite a lot. For once, we can be sure to actually capture every input that a user is doing. That is particularly important in the case of planetariums, for example, where we have multiple computers that need to do the same thing for the same interaction. And being able to, to, to capture all of the Lua scripts that are flying around and synchronizing those between different computers allows us to do that on, on a large scale. So with up to a couple of dozen computers that are running at the same time. So this kind of uh, illustrates that, where we're having a Lua script, which essentially now um, we disable the Earth, and then um, we're synchronizing that out. So in this case, we're sending it to a number of peers that are, that are executing the same kind of command. But then we can also store all of the commands into a file, which in our case we call session provenance. And then if it goes to other computers that are in physically distant locations, we call that astrocasting. But then there is another whole layer on top of that. So it's all layers on layers. Uh, so we have the Lua, all of the Lua scripting uh, that we support. As I said, it can support everything except mouse input and joystick input. Um, so in order to give users more expressive power to do what they, what they really want to do, uh, we connected Lua with JavaScript. And then people can write JavaScript. That gets automatically translated down to Lua, executed by OpenSpace and everything happens. So that makes it a lot easier because there are a lot more JavaScript developers out there than there are Lua developers, which is good. Um, but also it allows us to run open space, or not run, but control open space from a web browser. So on the one side, we run our main user interface through a web browser and well, not really web browser, but through Chromium embedded framework within open space. So what you're seeing in the bottom of this of the slide is actually our user, our regular user interface that can either run within open space, but also as a as a separate browser in an external instance. So that makes it a lot more powerful as well. But also people can build their own user interfaces. So here is a user interface that is specifically designed for controlling uh, our Apollo scene, for being able to quickly find things and during a presentation not dig through hundreds of different menu items and so forth. But also on the more fun side, people can build their own uh, kind of user interfaces. So here, uh, one of our, our partners, uh, Illuminati, uh, they built a custom user interface where they controlled a sh um, ship wheel to control open space in their uh, hemispheric uh, display surface. And we got to control those as well, which was really, really fun. And this is at the, at the essence of what I meant in the beginning, that I want to enable people to do things that I could never have thought of myself. And I think that's where open source software really, really starts to shine. And here's another piece of completely novel user interface that uh, we had nothing to do with, which was only possible because there are so many well-defined uh, interfaces between the software and the outside world. But now before, uh, it's the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, highlighting this point yet a second time. Um, so the design philosophy that we have, like, I haven't really found a good metaphor for that yet. It's like, uh, I'm not your mom is a good one, but then also we want to allow people to shoot themselves in the foot if something good comes out of it in the, mean, in the, in the meantime. But in essence, it comes down to that we want to build a system that allows people to do very quick and dirty tinkering with the system. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but the, the times where it works, is uh, those are the good ones. And as a very concrete example, this was just on Friday. One of our uh, power users, James, uh, he just sent on our, our Slack a message whether we can render out a Z pass 
of the rendering, which open space does not support by default. But I was just playing around with it and just giving him like a couple of lines where he needs to uh, edit the shader code and everything. And I wasn't really know I didn't I didn't really know what he was going for with this. But then about half um, half an hour later or so, he sent me back an image of open space with depth of field rendering again, which we do not support. And this was really exciting because again, I hadn't really considered that because it's not really normal in the use in the use case for real time software. Like if I have eight milliseconds to render a frame, like doing depth of field is taking a lot of that chunk of the rendering time. But he did it offline, did that, and it looked fantastic. And then a day or two days later, uh, he puts up a video on his YouTube and his Instagram of Apollo 11 landing, all rendered with depth of field using this dirty hack that I would never recommend putting into the release, actually, uh, just to render this out. And this worked for him, and it enabled him to do something that was previously not possible, which was really, really great. All right, so now if the demo gods are with me, I'll uh, switch over to see if this works. So now we'll be seeing open space, and now everything is live and interactive. So again, if you're making my video a bit bigger, you'll be able to see everything in glorious resolution. So um, if I get started here. So given the time, I want to, like, uh, normally we would prepare a lot of different things, but because this is an open source talk, uh, I want to pull back the curtain a bit. So you're going to see a lot of console opening and entering, t entering things by hand. So uh, just bear with me here. So. Let me start by adding a new asset, which is the Apollo mission. So now we're we're loading this on the back end. And as it's loading, just continue talking. So basically, this is uh, showing the diff some of the different Apollo missions that have been uh, that have been shown and showing them in their correct uh, in the correct time and frame. So if we start out with jumping back to December 1968. Messing about with this, and the ISS did not exist yet. Okay, so if we're moving the timer forwards a bit, you can see a uh, a red line that appears uh, on the Earth, and this is the the launch trajectory of Apollo Eight. So this was the first time that uh, humans left Earth and went to another planetary body, and after the second rotation, you can see that they are firing their rockets and they're flying into space, and we are moving outside together with them. And here's the first time that normally we would spend a lot of time talking about. But here you can see actually that we're we're still in the rotating frame of the of the Earth. So the the normally straight orbit looks a bit strange. So if we're if we're turning on the uh, the Apollo, the Earth, the trail relative to the Earth Barry Center, we can see that now we're, we can actually see those two coordinate frames at the same time. And now we're not really interested in the launch trail anymore. So uh, zooming out, here, this, uh, the red line that shows up the, in the bottom, that is the orbit of the, of the moon. And as we're moving faster, three days later, the astronauts arrived at the moon. And here we're having exactly the same problem again, or not problem, opportunity to do, to explain. The red line is still in the coordinate frame of the Earth. So if we're continuing with the movement, as Apollo 8 goes into orbit, it orbits around the moon, but the orbits the, the, the moon still orbits the Earth as it did before. So we can actually see the corkscrew maneuvers that it that it, uh, the spacecraft is doing. But if we're at the same time, looking at the trail in the moon coordinate frame, well, this looks more like an orbit as it is, as we would be expecting it. And after the 10th orbit around, they leave again back to Earth. So there's already like a very easy way of explaining different coordinate systems and in a very intuitive and tangible way. Now I want to jump to another time, which is the second of these orbits that we had just that we just looked at. So here we have Apollo 8 as it is orbiting around around the moon for the second time. 
So we're orbiting, uh, moving a bit faster. So we can see that here we have Earth, um, Earth rising over the moon's surface. So here is one thing that we normally don't do in the dome because it doesn't really work very well, but on a flat screen it does. If I start zooming in now, so now we're moving the camera inside of the uh, Apollo spacecraft and with a bit of tricky navigation, somewhere here, oh, there it is, we can see the Earth through one of the windows of the Apollo spacecraft. And you would be wondering, like, why is this important? If I open up one of my other screens here and just drag something in, because at this moment in time, the, the three Apollo uh, astronauts on Apollo 8 were taking one of the images that many of you will probably recognize, which is the Earth, the Earth rise image, one of the most famous images coming out of uh, out of the space, out of the uh, well, space exploration of the Apollo program, and this is exactly the moment then when they were taking that, and we can recreate that to the second. And if I start messing about with the with the camera settings a bit more, I'm not blind. There we go. So we can move that around, make it a bit smaller. and compare it a bit nicer here as well. And we can compare like those two images next to each other. And it's all based on real data, which is fantastic. All right, so if I move back outwards, we can leave the spacecraft. And get rid of the image. So the last thing that I want to do with the time is actually to go to our next destination in space. So if we're zooming out, we send the blue line is the orbit trail of the of the Earth. And here we have the whole solar system. And now I want to focus on Mars. So flying in. You can see Mars and its two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Here we have Mount Olympus, the highest uh, the highest uh, volcano and mountain in the solar system. And if I orbit around a bit, rather play with time so that we can, uh, here it's actually quite cool to see. You can see Mount Olympus much better now because it's actually so so large that it sticks out of the atmosphere of Mars, which does, doesn't happen on Earth. So, just to the other side of Mount Olympus, we have the Valles Marineris, one of the giant craters of Mars. And we're upside down, so if we're putting north upwards. So here you're seeing uh, one crater, a crater that's about the size of Europe on a world that's, I think, two thirds the size of Earth. So it's it's an enormous gash. Uh, 10 kilometer um, side, uh, fall down from the sides to the bottom. It's it's enormous in every in every way possible. And we're looking at it currently with um, with uh, an image that has a resolution of about 250 meters per pixel. But we have sent much higher resolution cameras to Mars. So if we're looking at uh, the CTX data, which is uh, has about a six meter resolution, we can see a lot more a lot more detail. And also the data set that we have is not yet complete. So you can also see the strips that are happening. This again, in a public setting, it's a great example to actually show that, oh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is in a polar orbit. So you can see that all of the strips are aligned with the north-south uh, orientation of Mars. And this is, this is like a, a great example to be able to explain different, uh, um, different satellite, pa satellite patterns and so forth. But I want to have a look at one particular area on Mars, which is Ganges Chasma and this particular area. So this is a rock formation in Ganges Chasma. And we have the CTX that I, that I enabled has a pretty high resolution, um, which is, as I said, six meters per pixel. But if we're getting closer, we are very, very much reaching the limit of this uh, 
of this instrument. But the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter also had a different instrument on board, which is the high-rise camera, which we have a higher resolution image of uh, here. So now we're downloading the images over the internet. And uh, a few seconds later, we have now 25 centimeter resolution. So that's yeah about a football in size per pixel on this area. And we're still having the height information from the laser altimeter, which is not really super great. Um, but the high-rise uh, instrument was taking so many pictures that uh, people could be using uh, um, basically stereo matching of different images in order to reconstruct the height information. So if I just quickly enable that, Gandhi's Chasma, we're bouncing around a bit, and now we have uh, about a meter height resolution as we're flying on this in this, uh, well, through Ganges Casma and looking at these. And now you might be wondering, it's like, we don't really have a good scale for everything. So um, for this, if we just enable the, the mother of all scales, which here comes the, the hacking, because it's, it's not supposed to be on the side. If I move the Eiffel Tower and move it a bit, a bit more right side up, now we get a, a much better understanding for the large scales that are actually at play here. Um, I was trying to find an like a model of the shard in London, but unfortunately, all of the models that I could find were like a hundred bucks a piece or so. So the Eiffel Tower has to do for this. So we have a, a couple of more examples that uh, I'm. For time reasons, I can't really go into, but I would be happy to talk to anyone offline and uh, show them around. So we have um, a couple of uh, different missions that we can visualize, but I can't leave you without leaving Mars and showing you how far the universe goes as we're leaving Mars. We're leaving the solar system, moving into our local, the local neighborhood of our stars. seeing the, the closest of our stars, our Milky, a visual, um, a volumetric rendering of our Milky Way, our closest galaxies, the billion or so closest galaxies. Here's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that we saw earlier with billions of uh, kilometers, billions of light years away. And here we have the cosmic microwave background radiation. And oops, we're not supposed to fly through that, says Einstein. So uh, the CMB compresses really poorly. So I'll fly back. I'll fly back. Fly us back to Mars very quickly, and then uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that there are. Thank you. Okay, Alex. So I thought that was awesome. <laughs> really, really, another seven years of development. It'll be amazing, won't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's amazing okay. already. Yeah. Uh, Question from Aleth. Let's hear us. Do you support virtual reality headsets? There, there is very rudimentary support for VR headsets. So uh, I have an Oculus at home, and it works to look at it through the Oculus, but we don't really support the controllers yet. So that's still um, that's still something to do. Okay, um, but it's definitely on the list. Yeah, Red is asking: Is SGCT a mandatory dependency? That's Simple Graphics Cluster Toolkit. Exactly. So it is not a mandatory. Uh, um, requirements and uh, you can basically plug in whatever kind of uh, windowing framework you have. So under the hood, SGCT is built on top of GLFW, which is an open source windowing framework that's multi-platform, and you can use that straight out of the box as well. I mean, there's we don't have anything for that, but there is nothing in the in the code that would prevent that from happening. Okay, uh, one other question from Red wants to know um, where's it gone now? What's Right, question yes, so how friendly is open space for yeah. first time compilation developers? Um, well, if you try it out, I would be happy to hear your opinion. Uh, personally, I think it's friendly, but I'm also quite, bi quite biased. So we're trying our best to make it as friendly as possible. But given that all in all, the, the code that we are responsible for is a bit north of a quarter of a million lines of code, there is always edge cases here and there. Um, but in general, it should work very smooth. But let me know if it doesn't. Then we should make it more smoother. 
Okay. Anyone got any more questions? No, is that it for now? No more questions. Well, I, I thought that was I brilliant. Have one, I have a question. Sorry. Um, because uh, this reminds me very much of uh, Celestia. Yes. So, uh, did you have some experience or lessons learned from there, some contacts? Uh, so personally, I don't know anyone from Celestia. And their development, at least the public side of it, took a bit of a break um, about the time when I started putting down the first code for open space. So I think I don't like I can't wind back the clock, but I would I would be betting that if if the development if the development of Celestia would have been very active at the time we had started, we probably could have put like contributed to Celestia instead because it's a very nice uh, software, and there's a bunch of other open source uh, visualization tools like this as well that I didn't mention in the presentation. So there's uh, Gaia Sky, which is financed by ESA. Um, oh my God, there's um, Worldwide Telescope, which is done by the American Astronomical Society, which is more focused on images. And uh, the other one that I'm forgetting right now is, nope, I'm forgetting it. But uh, there's, there's a bunch of these softwares available. And we're not, like, we don't want to compete with anyone. I mean, if anyone wants to use open space for these things, as I said, it's MIT license. Do with it what you want. Right, great. Um, but I think there's definitely space for a lot of kind of uh, these visualization softwares that are all going in slightly different directions. OK, no further questions? OK, then I think we'll wrap up for this evening. And I'd just like to thank our speakers once again this evening for the wonderful presentations. Letherius Cosmos from Libra Space, Arthur Schultz, Libra Cube, and of course, Alexander Bock from the Open Space Project. Okay. Okay, be my last week.